Dr. Billy Teals. He's gonna to talk to us about backyard habitats and the importance of maintaining those. Uh, Dr. Teals is a member of the Rio Brazos chapter of the Texas Master Naturalist. He is um, retired from the National Resources Conservation Service for more than 30 years. And he's been a member of our chapter since 2007. Everybody give a warm welcome to Dr. Billy Teal. Thank you, Amy. Uh, whenever we put this uh, subject together as part of the lecture series, contacting people from the National Wildlife Federation, actually they've been in this business of creating, restoring backyard habitat for a number of years, but we didn't get a response back from them. So you guys are stuck with me instead. <laughs> just just a, a little bit about me. I, Found, somebody found out that I was going to give a talk on this subject, and they said, well, Billy, you're finally talking about something you know something about. <laughs> and they, I didn't know quite how to take that. Like, they tell me that uh, I generally talk about stuff that I know nothing. And so, <laughs> at any rate, the, the National Wildlife Federation has been working in this area for quite a while. And we thought, as part of the lecture series, that it's, it would be important to, to know something about habitat in our yards because the, the purpose of the series is to answer questions about what can I do for the environment? So, you know, that's what you should be asking yourselves. That's why you should be here today is saying, what can I do that would support the environment? And uh, if you will notice all the subjects on these lecture series is about composting or recycling and so forth. So backyard habitats falls in line with, with all of those. So I'm going to do a couple of things today. Uh, one to begin with, which is to lay out the need to answer the question, why? Why do we even need to manage the backyard habitats? And then I'll get into some of the general how to do it. And I'll only go for as long as about an hour and then we're gonna open it up. So I may quit wherever I am and not finish up. So we'll, we'll see how this goes. I've got quite a, bit of, uh, quite a bit of slides laid out. So let's begin. We were just talking about technical problems. So we used to have technical problems would be if we spilled or tried or slide <laughs> or if the bulb didn't work. Does that work for you now? Let's see. Yep. It appears to be. All right. So this is John Muir. He's one of our first American naturalists. And he uttered these words over 150 years ago. He said, from one tug at a single thing in nature, he finds that it's attached to the rest of the world. And I don't think he knew how prophetic he would be when he uttered those words, because man is about to tug at this world to the point that it's about to break. So I don't know how many of you, of you were alive back in the late 60s, early 70s, but there was this books published by Paul Ehrlich called Population Bomb. And in the book, he made the point that we can't continue to increase our population on Earth because sooner or later it's got to break. You know, he's making the point, he is an ecologist, he studied insects. He know that most population curves follow this F-shaped curve, S-shaped curve, where it's a gradual slope. <laughs> rises fairly rapidly and then planes out at the end. The reason that it planes out in the end is because those populations, whether they're insects or mammals or birds, generally run out of resources. And he made the projection that this was going to happen to the human population. At the time he wrote the book, there's about 3.5 billion people on the earth. He says we can't possibly reach 
7 billion people on earth. And in the next 50 years, we were going to do that unless something happened. He predicted something would happen, that there would be famine or there would be uh, disease or there would be wars that would cause the human population to decline. And I'm asking y'all this question. Did that happen? No. Well, it did happen. We, we've had... We've had wars and we've had famine, but not to the extent that it ever caused the population to decline. This is the this is the population curve. You can see it starts out gradual slope, goes up like this, and then he predicted that it would level out, go this way, but it didn't. This keeps on rising, doesn't it? So Paul Ehrlich is now the ridicule, has been for ages, of practically every economist in the world. They said Paul Ehrlich was wrong back in the 70s, that technology would keep up with the human population growth, that we'd be able to produce more food on less acres, that we would be able to tolerate one another where we wouldn't have wars and famine and that sort of thing. So even though we have that, that hasn't stopped our population from climbing, has it? So, is there any way we can get rid of that? Can you if let me see that for sure? Actually, I'm going to put it up there. All right. All right. Thank you, Amy. Well, now it's not working at all again. <laughs> I'm just going to wait. All right. Go back one slide. No, that's forward. All right. Running both of those things at the same time is making a bit of a. Why is that working? That's not the one you want there. Go back. You did go back one to Elizabeth Colbert. Now you're going forward. You just have to talk faster, really. <laughs> this is fast as I can talk. It's just going by itself. Now that you talk to the lower left hand corner, there's two areas. Yeah. Thank you. Is this where you want to be? No, I want to be back. One more. All right. Let's. No. One. There. there. So let's read this down at the bottom. That's why I wanted that removed. Are you going to sit up here? And... All right. So while she does that, let's read this. Our population on Earth just reached 8 billion people. Y'all know when that happened? Isn't it? You know, when I was putting this slide presentation together, we reached 8 billion people on this Earth in, in November. We're having such an impact on, on Earth that our planet, we're having such an impact on our planet. Scientists have proposed creating a new geological epoch. The Anthropocene. So, uh, our resident geologist has told me that that has to take some committee to give the blessing on. So, we haven't reached the Anthropocene yet, but there's several signs that we are headed into a different area of, uh, of wherever the geologists say the line is drawn for our epochs to go from one to the other. People tell me, for example, that the Earth's crust, the elements on the Earth's crust is changing. 
We know that the, the oceans are acidified. And we know that our atmosphere has more carbon in it than ever before. And we know, uh, not ever before, but at least in recent times. And we also know that the biology on Earth is changing tremendously. Let's go to the next slide. That would be going the wrong way. The other way. So we've only been in existence for 200,000 years. Yet our impact on the planet is so great that scientists are proposing this new epoch. And the quote from Harvey Manning, which is a, a renowned British ecologist, he says, looking across the world at the present time, it is obvious that to anybody at all who has even the slightest bit of biological knowledge that the human numbers are already out of balance. Let's build the next slide. So I mentioned that the biology is changing. This is the extinction rate in the green curve, and that is the human population rate in the, in the purple curve. And you can see that we're losing species on the earth, both plants and animals. Since 1900, we've lost about 40,000 species. And some people say, that's not a big deal. Most of these species are minor. And they don't contribute a lot to our ecology. Remember what Albo Leopold said about uh, in the art of ecological tinkering, who but a fool would throw away some of the parts? Well, we're losing the parts. We may not know exactly what it is everything do, but we're losing it at, at, at about, you know, since 1900, 40,000 different species have become extinct. Let's go to the next slide. And a lot of people will argue that that's not a big deal. Every species that's ever lived on Earth, except for just the tip of the iceberg here, has gone extinct. Extinction is a natural process. Yeah, but it's not natural in the terms of anything that we remember. The extinction rate today is greater than it's been since the last great extinction event, which took place 65 million years ago. And the argument is, is that we, every time that an extinction place, and there has been five extinctions, five great extinctions that have happened up until now, that most of these extinctions were very pronounced. It changed the way that the earth felt and looked. It caused the, uh, the oceans to become a different chemistry. Volcanic activity took place or an asteroid hit the planet, which is what we think prompted the last great extinction back 65 million years ago. All big physical events. This extinction event is not because of some physical activity, it's because of us. A single species right now is causing the great decline in the world's plant and animal populations. And I don't know if you all are familiar with this book, but Elizabeth Colbert, a few years ago, made a, a compelling argument that we can't go on like this, that we are in a sixth extinction, and it's just another sign that the Earth is in trouble. Go to the next slide. So if that didn't catch your attention, this might. So the World Wildlife Fund conducts this global living planet index, which they examine the populations of over 30,000 different species, of over 30,000 different populations, of which about 5,000 different species is involved. And since 1970, the abundance of those populations has dropped nearly 70%. Now, whether extinction rate is 40,000 species or whether there is a decline in abundance in animal population of the planet that is 70 percent, this, you know, the, the numbers don't have to be precise for us to know that these are big signals that the 
that the planet is losing biological diversity. Go to the next. <laughs> Did you read that for us? <laughs> We got a stegosaurus up there that's looking out at a conference, much like this one, <laughs> of different dinosaurs. And he says, the picture's pretty bleak, gentlemen. The world's climates are changing, the mammals are taking over, and we all have a brain about the size of a walnut. <laughs> so, you know, hopefully the differences between the dinosaurs and us is that we have a brain bigger than a wall. <laughs> so let's go to the next slide. So this is Aldo Leopold. And I, I like Aldo Leopold because he thinks that man can do better, that we have a brain bigger than the size of a wall. This, this quote from him is one of my favorites because uh, today we're talking about planting and he tries to relate planting to human existence and what we do as a species is it's one ever one of our remote ancestors invented the axe we became a taker we could cut down a tree whenever he invented the shovel we became a gift we could plant one back again and with that we've been given the divine responsibility of deciding which plant lives and which plant dies He's talking not just, you know, you got to kind of know Aldo Leopold, but he's not talking about just what happened in his backyard, although it applies there too. He's talking about man, the manipulator. That's who we are, that we evolved to manipulate the environment for our own benefit. However, you can give and you can take. Nature is resilient. We can do things to make our life on earth better if we just know what it is and conserve our natural resources. Go to the next. Okay, stop it. So this is an important slide. You've heard of biodiversity. It's, it's a lot of people when you ever start talking about biological diversity, their eyes just glaze over. When you start talking about ecological function, that's even, that's even harder to grasp. But the, the basis is this, is that that plant and animal community on the left, which is full of different species, performs greater function than that on the right. And the reason is, is that if you have a, a diverse biological community, it results in cleaner water, cleaner air, and healthier soils. And we could talk a long time about how it does that. Basically, the plants take in carbon dioxide, convert it to carbon, and that's transferred to the soil. And if you have more different kinds of organisms in a community, it does it a whole lot better than those where you have reduced the number of organisms in the community. A plowed field doesn't provide as many ecological benefits as a, as a prairie. So that's the, that's the concept of biodiversity. You're gonna hear biodiversity tossed around a lot, but basically what biodiversity is, is having natural, as close to the natural, uh, kind of plant community that you can get. A natural ecosystem will produce more ecological services than one that is manipulated. And it's also kind of important to know why we're losing biological diversity. And it's mainly because of habitat. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay. food process of habitat fragmentation. Little by little, one fragment is lost, another fragment is lost, till you get to a fragment that's so small that it can't support a population. 
And how small is that? Go to the next slide. You can't see the small fragments on this slide, but suppose that there is a small fragment right here, which is what that slide should illustrate, where the gene flow doesn't go to that small fragment. And let's say that disease hits that small fragment and there is nothing left because there's no gene flow going to the fragment from the other small patches or from the other patches. That small fragment is an island and when it is isolated like that, it has no seed source, basically. So that small fragment dies out. The population that's in that small fragment dies out. Go to the next. And we know enough to know that if we establish corridors or we establish new fragments within this overall landscape, that that helps the population. Problem is we're going the other way. We're creating more and more fragments. All right, go to the next. Here's a map of the United States with all the National Park Service lands and all the national monuments and national this and national that and so forth. That is a perfect illustration of a fragmented landscape. Yet we can't hope to have healthy plant animal population if that is the only way that we're gonna happen. There are no corridors between the two. So if you're gonna have a healthy animal population, healthy plant populations, there's got to be enough fragments where there will be some kind of connection. Go ahead. Here's the land use in the United States. And I promise we're gonna to get to our backyards in just a minute. <laughs> but first you gotta be convinced that we need to do something because it's a problem. I mean, why would you want to manage backyard habitat if, if it wasn't a problem? And you know, why would I, which is what the series is about, want to do something about it? This is land use in the United States that is from, do you have the pointer there? Let's see. From the National Resources Inventory. I just want to use the yeah, point. Let me turn it back on. There you go. All right. Which is an inventory of all the land use slash coverage in the United States. And you notice that there's only 21% federal land. If all the federal land was managed perfectly and providing habitat, that wouldn't be enough because there's not no 70% of the United States is privately owned and is manipulated to one extent or another. So let's, let's take a look. 18% is crop land, which is basically cultivated land. 21% is range land, which is basically herbaceous vegetation that's grazed. About 21% is forest land which is privately held forest land, which is either small landowner ownerships or big forest companies like Weyerhaeuser. Hmm. I think I did that myself. Yep. <laughs> so it looks like it's working right now. Let's, let's, let's see if I can run it for a while and if we don't, we'll, we'll let's come back. So, we're talking about our backyards. We're talking about this piece of the pie right here in development land. There's 115, 111 million acres of developed land out of 1,938 million acres in the United States. So we're not talking about a big piece of the pie. We're talking about restoring our, our yards. We're talking about 40 million acres in the United States. So people have taken a look at this and in the article that you saw in the newspaper, I, I mentioned this book right here, it's called Nature's Best Hope, 
by Doug Colomay. He makes the case that homeowners can take environmental action in their own hands one yard at a time. This homegrown approach sidesteps the short-sightedness of governmental policy and the physical limitations of our isolated national parks, empowering us to make our planet a better place. I mentioned the National Wildlife Federation for more than 50 years has been in this business of helping people establish backyard habitat. And they make the argument, and it's pretty compelling, that a natural, remember why when we talked about biodiversity and how many diverse species provide more ecological function than the ones that are manipulated? They say not only is this more valuable from an ecological standpoint, but if we have our turf management like we have in most yards, that that increases the cost because it costs to mow. It provides environmental problems such as fertilizers on yards and herbicides on yards that run off into our waterways. And we have to water. So there's lots of reasons why you might want a yard like this as opposed to this right here. Yet we're required by the subdivision ordinances that we have to have yards that look like this. So he gives 10 different steps that we should follow in order to establish a, a lawn that would be a greater ecological function. And he says, basically, our problem is this, is that we compartmentalize places where we live, where we work, and where we play, at least outside. And he says, instead of having separate areas, we need to be thinking about nature in our backyards and nature in work and not depend on going to some state park or federal park to enjoy nature. You see, we've gotten into this, this problem because of our attitudes, our concept about lawns. And he makes the argument that, that lawns need to be diverse. Here's typically what we do whenever we develop a neighborhood. Y'all might recognize this subdivision. <laughs> you might live there. Here's typically what we do. We, we scrape off the top soil. We, plat, we put in the roads and infrastructure. We plat out the, the houses and then put our little cookie cutter houses on those lots. <clears throat> then we establish the lawn. And then we hire a management firm to drive up and down the street. I call them the lawn Nazis. <laughs> Take pictures of our yard. If we have grasses that's more than 12 inches high, well, they report us into the subdivision, to the homeowners association, and we get a letter from them. And the letter looks a lot like this. <laughs> we live in a nice neighborhood. And up and down our street, we all work hard to keep our yards picked up. Grass mowed, trees trimmed, and so forth. It's what good neighbors do. Very, very pleasant so far, isn't it? <laughs> Please be courteous and respectful to the rest of us doing our part by cleaning up your front yard. It's overgrown with weeds and is an eyesore to the rest of us who actually care enough to take care of our homes and yards. We all work, have families and so forth, but we make the time. We're simply asking for you to do the same respectfully, your neighbors. This, as you can imagine, is, is controversial in a lot of cases. People that want to have backyards or even front yards that are somewhat natural have this constraint of dealing with landowners and uh, you know homeowners associations that want the perfect lawn. So, in other places, there's a growing sentiment to have natural yards and not to have homeowners associated associations prohibit what they can and can't do. And Maryland is one of these states. In 2001, they passed a law 
And it's called the Low Impact Landscaping Bill. And in a nutshell, communities, including homeowners associations, can no longer require turf in yards or ban certain types of gardens. Enough controversy was happening there between the homeowners associations and individual landowners who wanted to have natural landscapes that Maryland passed a law in favor of having natural landscapes. Now, it wasn't just a single homeowner, it was many homeowners. And in passing the law, they just didn't use one or two homeowners as example. The Realtors Association and as well as the Chambers of Commerce got down with the state legislature and they began to put together legislation that recognized these kinds of laws as having value. Not only do they have value from the environmental standpoint, but they are arguing in Maryland that they have value from an economic standpoint as well. Realtors and chambers of commerce are seeing these types of yards as an economic benefit. Yeah. So let's read on here because it's it's landmark le legislation as far as I'm concerned. It, instead, the new law the new law allows landowners to convert their lawns to habitats to benefit pollinators, birds, and other wildlife, and to install rain gardens and xeriscaping to help manage storm water runoff and conserve water. Yes, even front yards. Now, the title of this talk is Backyard Habitat, but in Maryland, they're even looking at their front yards. This may mean our expanses of uniform green lawn may change, but that's a trend that has been gathering steam across the country for years as our planet faces drought, climate change, and diversity crisis. And this is in the same article, the truth about turf. Consider this, in quest of the perfect turf or damage in our own health and the planet's plus our pets. To keep our lawns green and weed free, each year Americans spend over $40 billion and apply nearly 60 million pounds of hazardous pesticides. Watering our lawns and gardens accounts for a third of our residential water use, nearly 9 billion gallons a day, according to EPA. And here's the thing, is, is the why. Why do we do that? So since the 1950s, with the advent of suburbs and manufacturing companies seeking out new markets for their chemicals after the Second World War, we've been programmed to nurture grass. It's fed, watered, dressed, treated, and cut on a routine schedule, which would make doctors proud. When it acts or seems ill, it gets special care, all, the tune, all to the tune of 150 hours a year for long. If grass reciprocated a bit more, say prevented flooding from storm water runoff, clean our air, or serve as wildlife habitat, perhaps it might be worthwhile, but it doesn't. It does the exact opposite of that. So that's why they have the lawn in Maryland the law in Maryland. Again, back to the National Wildlife Federation. We don't live in Maryland, we live in Texas. And it's somewhat harder in Texas to deal with homeowners associations than it is in Maryland, particularly now that they have the law. But the National Wildlife Federation has provided some guidance on what we need to do to green our homeowners association. All you got to do is go on to their website and you can fool around there and enough and it's kind of hard to deal with, but you can find out different types of information that deal with homeowners association. And it got this handy dandy guide that gives you examples of ordinances that's passed in states other than where they have the law there in Maryland that will help you, again, deal with your zone, homeowners association. And Texas is not without law, and it's not without precedence. So we have a law in Texas that's aimed not at yards, but at water conservation. 
but I can read this and, you know, maybe I'm looking for loopholes, maybe I'm not. I can read this to say that the Texas law mm -hmm. provides us a way into managing our backyards for not only wildlife, but any kind of natural cover. Here's what Texas did. A law was passed in September 2013, and its language is pretty simple, which is rare. Generally, it allows homeowners and Texas associations to landscape in ways that reduce water consumption without worry that their HOA will prohibit the actions or force them to undo the laws measures. Specifically, it prohibits HOAs from enforcing provisions in their governing documents, typically known as covenants, that prevent owners from composting vegetation, installing rain barrels, implementing irrigation systems that are efficient. Here's the part that's important. Using drought-resistant landscaping or water-conserving turf. Now, what does drought-resistant landscaping sound to you like? Okay. That's what I would argue too. But I've had this conversation with my homeowners association. <laughs> so they say this is for this is for water conservation. We can still, even with this language, say when you mow and how often you mow, and also the height of the vegetation. So Let's talk a little bit about my homeowners association. And I'm, I'm telling you, you need to work with your homeowners association. And ours is pretty good when it comes to managing our, our vegetation and natural uh, conditions. So uh, I'm, I'm gonna give a shout out before the end of this that you know homeowners associations can be worked with and, and you need to do so. So next slide here. <coughs> So some cities, like the city of Boston, have dealt with this problem, and they say, yeah, within the city, we want to have this ordinance where we have most of our properties well maintained, but for those of you who want to have, and this is called a, a tall grass ordinance, want to have an exception, we'll provide for that. But the exceptions have these restrictions. And the restriction is, and this is an exception, remember, the, the rule is you got to keep your, your, large, your lawns maintained, except a landscaped area arranged and managed consistent with the plan accepted by the city, which area includes native or adapted vegetation for weed control and other periodic maintenance occurs. So they can have their tall grass prairies in Austin if they follow those guidelines. This is Google Earth picture of 2500 Wills Way Drive here in Granbury, Texas. That's where my wife, Phyllis, and I live. And, you know, I didn't doctor this. This is what you go to Google Earth and this is the way it looks. See that sign right there? It says Wildflower Management Area. See that area right there? Yeah. Plus, there's uh, other areas there that aren't mowed. There's milkweed now. That's what it looked like the month before. Now, we don't mow this the way that most malt lawns are mowed. We, we mow it in a way that it maintains the seed source, the blue bonnet seeds and the milkweed seeds. And there are many other different plants in that little area that it's not only beneficial to the environment, but it's beautiful in my, my estimation. So for years, our homeowners association have allowed us to put up this sign and manage this area in a way that we didn't get deemed by the homeowners association. And here about a year ago, we got a letter in the mail that's much like the letter that I read earlier, along with the picture of our property, and I noticed that we have to move the area within a couple of weeks. So 
we said, what the heck? So, you know, we've been doing this for the 18 years we've lived here. So naturally, we contacted the board, the Homeowners Association board. And they said, you, we, we changed companies, but we don't see anything in our covenants that allows for an exception. So our Homeowners Association was nice enough not to start enforcing the ordinance, which is kind of like the rest of them. We're supposed to mow our lawns every so often, and it's supposed to be a certain height. We were basically operating under an under-the-table agreement, I guess, with the former board, but it was not in the covenant. So this board says, look, if you're going to have this thing and we don't not support it, you need to do it by amending the covenants. So we said, all right, how do we do that? So they were nice enough to bring people together, not just me and not just my neighbors who were having the same problem, but people across the the whole subdivision in and invite them to, to talk about it and to draft language that we could put into the covenants that would allow for this sort of thing, which we call a, a wildfire management area. Of course, you know, I was making the argument that there are other cities, there are other communities which have these sort of exceptions and that uh, everybody in the community ought to read Doug Ptolemy's book before we began the, the election, election voting, began the voting on the amendments. So here's the language. The reason I'm putting up here this is that some of y'all might be wanting to do the same thing. So this is for the wildflower management area. This is the amendment that was voted on. Owners and occupants, including leases of any tract shall jointly and generally be allowed to maintain areas of their tract as a wildflower management area with the following restrictions. Only areas of the tract that contain wildflowers are exempt from mowing until July 4th. Wildflower management areas must display a wildflower management sign all areas not containing wildfires must be maintained for Section 314, which says you need to main it, maintain it at uh, less than 12 inches and so forth, and maintain a buffer of four feet from all the neighboring properties. Now, we, we have to have two-thirds of the, of the residents or the households in our neighborhood vote. And so far, we haven't had that, so I can't say whether or not this has passed or failed, but at least it's caught everybody's attention. So let me show you something else. You see in our front yard, this is our backyard. Now, what's that look like? Now, yeah, it's native grass. It's uh, basically 25% of the yard is tall grass prairie. So, Others than myself in the neighborhood are saying there's there's more than just wildflowers. You know, what we should be doing is maintaining natural habitats and prairies in this part of the world on my soil is what would have been there naturally. And you can't have the same mooring regime that we have on our wildflower management areas as we have on our native grasses. And basically what that Wildflower management area says is that after the 4th of July, we mow the lawn to 12 inches, less than 12 inches. Just we maintain it like we would if it were a lawn, like a turf grass lawn. But at the end of the growing season, we don't mow it again until July 4th. That allows all those cool season plants to become established. The Indian paintbrush, the blue bonnets, the antelope horn milkweed, all kind of the cool season plants do pretty well under that regime. But warm season plants don't, and perennials of most kinds don't. So it didn't really fix the problem that we had for, for a native prairie. So we had to develop additional amendments. 
Now, you kind of got the gist. I'm not going to read this thing, but basically what this says is if you have an area that's approved by the board, you don't have to mow it any except to, to maintain appearance and to make sure that you're not a fire hazard and you're not bothering your neighbors, basically. You, you can read that. And it, it's kind of, you know, I don't like to have to work with all these restrictions and all these exceptions, but in this day and age, that's kind of the way you got to do it. The fact that my homeowners association will work with us at all is sort of amazing. I'm, I'm happy that they do that. And I'm not, uh, I'm not being in my homeowners association. That's, that's something you'll have to do as well. But I have any questions, go ahead. But does a Texas and city ordinance overrule HOA? Because that's how I get around my own check. Mm -hmm. I go based on what the city states, what the Tex uh, Texas rules, and I've gotten away with a lot. Well, I suppose, I suppose the answer is yes, if you can make the argument that uh, water conserving yeah. vegetation, but Texas doesn't have a law like uh, Maryland that recognizes yeah. natural vegetation. You have to link it to water conservation, yeah. which can be done. Did you plant your prairie grass or did you just let it grow out? I, I'm going to. Okay, sorry. No, I, I'm, I'm going to do this one more slide and then I'm going to go to the end because I'm running out of time. Uh, the answer is no, I didn't. My native grass was there all along, but I'm, I'm going to show you. I'm going to jump a bunch of slides. I'm going to show you what it looked like. That, that's the that's the middle of summer. This is my neighbor's lawn. All that light area there is Bermuda grass. See the reddish looking grass? Most of that's King Ranch blue stem. You wouldn't want that either. But within that King Ranch blue stem, about every three feet, there is a little uh, little blue stem or a little switch grass or a little Indian grass or a little big blue stem. And I cut, I hold out the areas that were the plants I didn't want, doing like Aldo Leopold said, deciding which plants live and which plants die. So you can do that. We need to have a whole nother session, here, really, on, on how to. Uh, I'll bore you to death if we go through, and it'll take way too much time if we if we talk about how to in this session. But there are ways that this can be done. You can range seed. We in the Natural Resources Conservation Service have been doing that for years. But probably, if you're just talking about a yard, you don't want to plow up everything and then restart it from, from scratch. It takes a long time and you very little progress the first few years. and Sometimes it doesn't work at all. Probably what you'd want to do is establish plugs or mature container grown plants of grasses and, and plant them. Again, we're getting into the how-tos and there's, there's lots of things that you should consider in the how-to. The, the first thing in the how-tos, which I do want to talk about, is you should shrink the size of your lawn. You should shrink the size of your lawn and you, I'm always getting this question about fire. Well, doesn't that create a fire hazard? Well, we're not, we're not talking about doing away with your lawn. We're talking about having a goal of shrinking the size of your lawn about 50%. And it's a good idea to have an area of turf grass or, or lawn around the house so that fire doesn't spread to it. And, you know, I look at a lot of houses and, and their landscape. They have... They already have a bunch of fire vegeta vegetation that would catch on fire right up next to their house. Uh, you, you, you need to have uh, corridors between your wild plants and, and your house. And a, a good rule of thumb is to make a, a, a mowed area of at least as big as twice as tall as the vegetation that is next to it. 
And again, having a pretty good size lawn around the house does prevent some of that. I, you know, I like lawns. I, mean, I like to play baseball with all my grandkids. Most of them have played baseball with me. I, you know, I like to toss around the football, tell them to go long without having to worry about running into a peach tree or something. <laughs> so uh, we're, we're not talking about we're not talking about doing away with lawns. We're talking about reducing the size of lawns. And again, I, I think we need to have another whole session to talk about the how-tos and to follow the guidance that Doug Ptolemy suggests here. I'm gonna to go to the end of the presentation. Oh, just, <clears throat> this is how our lawn looks in the back. I mean, for all practical purposes, it looks like a native yeah. grass bird. And hey, Rachel, I let you do your backyard however you want to. Ah, uh, no. <laughs> I, we had to. We had to propose that tall grass amendment, which has all kinds of hoops that we have to go through. Not all frog grasses are the the big four, you know. We have another part of my lawn that's on a different soil that really is more adapted to short grasses. So that's something else you should do. You should take a look at your soil and see what will grow on, on your soil. And again, I'm getting into the how-to, and I, I think we need a whole nother, whole nother session on that. And there, if you, if you start kind of from scratch, you have all these other plants in there as well. They... Those plants are in our yard and they were there to begin with. I didn't, we didn't plant a single one. <coughs> Will a copy of this presentation be available somewhere? <laughs> Will a copy of this presentation be available somewhere? Well, we'll make it available on the, I'll see if I can get it on the Active Nature Center website. 